My guest on this episode of Adventure White is, I'm delighted to say, the first person to appear after a recommendation from one of my previous guests. Big thank you to guest number three, Richard Quigley, for the end. My guest today, to my shame, I have to add, runs a charity I hadn't actually heard about until we were introduced. But after doing some research for the show, I'm astounded by the work that they do. Today, I'm interviewing the lovely Rachel Thompson from the brilliant charity Pan Together. Rachel, welcome to Adventures of White. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. We've got to thank Richard, really, for this connection. Thank you, Richard. Absolutely. Rachel, let's kick it off. Let's talk about Pan Together, if that's okay. As I mentioned, I didn't actually know anything about Pan Together until I did some research for this. And I've got to say, the work that you seem to be doing is incredible. However, for anyone listening that doesn't know about the charity, what it is, what you do, what's the elevator pitch? What is, what's Pan Together? Pan Together is a charity and a membership-based organisation where members have a say and a vote in what we do. We exist fundamentally to support and provide a community hub for the residents of East Newport because many people in our local area face multiple challenges and are um, literally among society's most vulnerable and marginalised. Hmm. But it's got an interesting history because it began as a community centre in 2007 and for many years operated from a porter cabin. Till in 2016, and thanks to some funding from the local authority because of the impact of a big housing development nearby, it moved to its very own community centre. And a couple of years later, it became a charity which then enabled the trustees to apply successfully for National Lottery Community Fund monies, which in turn allowed the charity to employ me as community centre manager, and I've been there since mid-2019. So we do lots of things. We've got a community cafe, we've got an IT learning suite with eight computers and free Wi-Fi. We've got an amazing training kitchen with six fully functioning kitchen stations we've got community rooms an outside area for growing produce but what wow. we're really there for is to provide a hub to try and build a sense of community to prevent social isolation people from feeling lonely and to signpost people who are in need of help and support which we may or may not be able to provide, but hopefully we can point them in the right direction and thus in some way help to improve their circumstances. I said, Rachel, in the introduction that the work that the charity does is amazing. Actually, I've even learned more. You do that so much. How do you, what, you're doing this all from one location in Pan? All from one location and the services are developing all the time we're reliant on grant funding and donations and so on so depending what we manage to get funding for we do all sorts of different things so from running cookery sessions for young people who are at risk of offending to doing cookery sessions for parents and children i think the most exciting thing and the most important thing we're doing at the moment just six weeks or so ago we launched our pan community larder we got some funding from the Isle of Wight Foundation, which is the charitable arm of Island Roads. And our larder now provides fresh, frozen, tinned, dried, ambient food and other household essentials. We're open on Tuesdays and Fridays from 12 till 3. And local residents in Pan Meadows, Barton, Fairley, can come along and get two carrier bags of shopping a week. At the moment, we're not charging, but we will soon be introducing a five pound a visit charge. But the difference it's making at these times when the cost of living crisis is biting so very hard is tremendous. And some of the stories people tell us are hair rate. So that's amazing. Tell me those areas again. So we spoke about East of Newport. What, it's what, East what... Newport, basically. Yeah. So it's yeah. Pan Meadows, which is the new part of Pan up above Asda in Newport, basically. Mm -hmm. And then Barton, which is down towards Coppins Bridge and the, the big roundabout. And then Fairley, 
which is up towards where the Isle of Wight Festival site is. Wow. So that's a huge area. And people can come with and take two carrier bags of those goods away for yep. free at the moment. How on earth are you funding that, Rachel? That must be a huge cost. And how do you, where are you storing all this stuff? The stuff is squirreled away in the community centre. We've had funding from a huge range of organisations, from the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Community Fund, to large donation from ASDA, from Fidelity International, lots of individuals and people bring in goods as well. So wow. it's but we're also from the funds we've managed to put into our community support fund, we're currently spending £250 a week maximum to stock the larder. That's incredibly generous of those donors to do yeah. that. You gave me some stats and let's dive into that if that's okay, because they're really quite shocking. So the Isle of Wight's most disadvantaged area you're serving, which is ranked 5.8% in England's most deprived neighbourhoods. So you said to me, in other words, 94% of places in the country are more affluent than Pan. That's really shocking, isn't it? That's insane when you think... The about interesting it. thing, then, is that those figures are from September 2019's deprivation wow. indices. And the hardship people are facing has undoubtedly worsened in the wake of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to put that into perspective, isn't it? You think we are, we were the fifth richest place on the planet. We're now the sixth richest place on the planet. But yet 94% of other places in the country are more affluent than something. Our capital town on the Isle of Wight, I just, I find that mind blowing. I've got a question for you. Why is that, do you think, Rachel? Can you give me an idea of that? Think, Tell me about some of these challenges. I think on the Isle of Wight in general, there's been a lack of, or there's been educational underachievement. And there's been a sort of lack of ambition and sense of direction. There are so many people here, because of the nature of the economy, who are in low-paid seasonal jobs and I think that education is a key to breaking the cycle of of such levels of deprivation. People in our local area have double the national average of mental health issues, there are an awful lot of carers so there's multiple challenges that people are facing and um, although the area is changing with the new development slightly. It is a really tough place to be. But by the same token, it's really important to say this. There are lots of really good, brilliant things about Pan that people like it as a place to live. There's a really, really strong sense of community. People know their neighbours. The, when you drive through Pan it doesn't look like a highly deprived area. I lived in Hackney in East London for many years and it doesn't look like it, the houses are well maintained, the gardens are nicely kept. In the main, obviously, there are exceptions, but it is a, it's a nice place to be. Levels of crime are lower than elsewhere in England. Levels of drug abuse are lower than elsewhere in England. So it's a really interesting balance, actually. And the other thing that's interesting is that there are high levels, high concentrations of families with young children next to lots of single pensioner households, lots of whom are in receipt of pension credit, which is what you get if you're on a lower income. So it's, a, it's an interesting picture. Yeah, I, I'm pleased you said that, actually. I was going to... I was going to reference my own experiences. I worked for a period of time near Osterley in London. And when I think of deprived areas, I apologies to anybody from Otterley listening, that part of town is, it, it was really quite, it was run down. And mm. it was, you could see the challenges just by driving mm. through it. The other stat you gave me, which I, as a former trustee of the Youth Trust, knew mm. anyway, but again, I find so shocking, is that 35% of local children are growing up in poverty there and that's against an average of 17 percent in england now oh yeah let's be honest that's kids that are relying on the generosity of others that's 
people who are relying on your fantastic sponsors to eat. We've got this whole yep. cost of living, living crisis. But in the pre-podcast chat, I was complaining about the fact I was cold in my nice mm. double glazed insulated house. So th- that's that's really quite stark. It's 35 percent. And again, that's from three years ago. The situation has not got better in the meantime. And no. interestingly, one group of people we're supporting more and more are families who are working families. And I can give you a tale of, I won't use their real names, but let's call them, I don't know, Mary and Pete, who live five minutes away from the community centre and have got three little boys. Um, Mary's got mental health issues and a raft of physical health difficulties. And Pete works full time. He earns five pounds too much to, for them to qualify for any single benefit or support and I've had the conversation with Mary to say couldn't he ask to do an hour or two less each week but he's too scared to ask his employer in case he loses his job. Ah so people utterly caught between a rock and a hard place. Absolutely absolutely or another example this one is Yes, really touched me, actually. On the first Tuesday our community larder opened, a young mum came in with her three-year-old little boy who walked through the door and just pointed at the apples and said, mummy, mummy, apples with great joy and delight. Anyway, this mum went on to tell us that she got three other children as well as her littlest one, And on the Monday, so this is the Tuesday, lunchtime, on the Monday, she told us that she'd taken her three older ones to school without having been able to feed them. Then she and her little one have gone home and turned all the electricity off apart from the fridge because they couldn't afford to have it on. The children came home from school and on the Tuesday morning, The mum, first thing she did, having taken the children to school without them having been fed, much to her shame, she went to the job centre to ask for a referral to the food bank. But the food bank wouldn't be open until Wednesday. So this is Tuesday morning. Fortunately, and because she was desperate, she went to see the family liaison officer at her children's school who said, if you hang around for another half hour, the community larder will be open and you can get two bags of shopping from there. Now, what that makes me think, Ben, is thank goodness we were there. But in another way, and I feel this really quite strongly, we shouldn't have to be. It's a damning indictment on society that a young woman with four little children to look after can't actually manage to feed them without charitable support. Yeah, it's outrageous, actually. Something Richard said in his interview with me is when the history of this period is written Mm. and we look back and we ask ourselves the question, why are 35% of children on the Isle of Wight in poverty? Why is PAN in the the 6% of most deprived Mm. areas of the entire country? And it's not through lack of lack of anything, is it? No. There's there is money. There is it's available. There is help. There is support. But why on why on earth do these people have to rely on the charity of others? I find it very frustrating. People that want we all want to better ourselves, right? We all want to yeah. do well. And these people with families, they can't to get a leg up. They've got to rely on somebody else. And it just and seems... people are proud. People exactly, are proud. Yeah. Then how do you solve that? What's the answer? Is it more money? I don't know. Is the answer? I think a reform of the benefit system, more investment in social related policies. I think we're often too reliant in this country on official structures. And I think the important thing about why Pan Together actually works is because we're rightly perceived as being outside officialdom, for want of a better term, because people either actually or perceptually have had bad experiences of official structures. So 
there's a lack of faith in formal institutions. We know that from people's view of politics and parliament, that people perceive that those in power are not there to support them. They're there for a different agenda. So I think there's a big thing to be said about being able to be non-judgmental and not saying, why have you... The approach needs to be not, why have you got yourself into this situation? Why are you owing the Housing Association all this rent? What's wrong with you? Pull yourself together. It's got to be, okay, this is where you find yourself. It's not a place you want to be in. What can we do to point you in the right direction to help you get out of the hole you don't mm. want to be in? How can we do that? One, 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 we give out crisis supermarket vouchers, and we're certainly doing that before we have the larder. And one mum said to us, I've never asked for help before because I find it extremely embarrassing. But I was getting so desperate, I was thinking about stealing food to feed the children. This is not where society should be no. in this part of the 21st century. No. I do wonder as well, Reggie, if it's about awareness. Those stats are shocking. You are obviously in the middle of doing this amazing work in Pan. But if I was to go to, you know, if I was to just grab the, a, a local person on the street and ask them, what's the poverty rate for children on the Isle of Wight in comparison yep. to the rest of the UK, I would probably guess... And maybe this is very unfair on that random person in the street that they would have wouldn't have a clue. I'm curious to know if I th I think awareness is an issue, and you're, you're doing right. a, you're doing a lot you're doing a lot of good work. How do you get that message out? How do you tell people about it? Obviously, you're taking part on my podcast. The people that will listen to this a handful, frankly, mm -hmm. but that needs to be amplified, doesn't it? So, what could you do to make people more aware of the challenges that people that are coming to your organisation? We work very closely in partnership with other community organisations on the island. So there's Aspire in Ride. The Ventnor Town Council do a lot of work in terms of providing an independent food bank. There's a great place called Baby Box and they run a community pantry. We work with the West White Sports and Community Centre and we're all doing the same sorts of work. And there, are, of course, there are other places that are doing it too. We're all doing the same sorts of work, but each organization has a different approach dependent on the local area and we get together and talk about things i think the key thing is obviously media coverage social media is very important but i think the way of raising awareness the most and i certainly try and do this amongst my friends and others is by telling stories that this is actually what is happening in Newport, in Ryde, in Ventnor, in Totland, Freshwater. Because of the nature of the Isle of Wight and there being affluent areas or relatively affluent areas, and because it's so beautiful, I think there's a masking of, <laughs> for want of a better term, what lies beneath. And the view is, we can't change the world, but we can make a difference, yeah. which that I think that's one of the key messages, because it's such a big issue that people are likely to say we can't do anything about that. You can actually buy, as one of my friends did this morning, asking me if I could think of a family who weren't going to be having many things this Christmas and what the ages of the children were. And could she and her partner buy Christmas presents for them anonymously? And the answer was yes, and I will be That's delivering lovely. those. So that will make a difference. It yeah. doesn't yeah. change the world, as I say, but... Perhaps if somebody listening to this wants to help, turn up with a bag of groceries to your food larder. Maybe Absolutely. that would help. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's talk about, see, we're coming to the end of the year. What does the next year look like for Pan Together? You rattled through a whole list of amazing things which you're currently doing. I have a suspicion just from talking to you for half an hour or so that you've got a list, the length of your arm you want to achieve. So what does next year look like? Before we move on to what next year looks like, I'd quite like to say that in many ways, 2022 has been a totally momentous year for Pan Together because we had an impressive visit from the Earl and Countess of Wessex, Prince Edward and Sophie in May to thank our volunteers 
for everything they did during the pandemic when people were helped in five and a half thousand different ways, which mm. is astonishing. And then as part of the late Queen's Jubilee celebrations, we were awarded the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, which is the organisational equivalent of an MBE and the highest thing that a voluntary organisation can get in the UK. So these are massive accolades and they're not things that happen often in the community such as ours. And it was such a boost to our volunteers. But what we're doing now is perhaps more momentous than all of it, which is providing even more direct support when people are, and they shouldn't have to be, having to choose between food and fuel and children's clothes. And I'm afraid that what lies in store for 2023 is doing even more of that more intensively because times are only going to get tougher, which is a grim message. And I don't want to be grim, but it's the reality. Very early in January, we're going to be launching a warm space a couple of times a week in our IT room on the grounds of people turn off your electricity and your heating and come and use ours instead. So two full days a week, we'll be offering food roll refreshments, use of the IT room, learning digital skills, got a telly in there. It'd be really interesting to see who comes along and what the, what the age breakdown is. We're hopefully going to be relaunching our youth club in early-ish 2023 and then the sort of fundamental thing is we never quite know what's around the corner because we are dependent on getting a funding stream to do something but we do know there's going to be lots more cookery sessions and yes lots of interesting stuff going on in well, one way shape or form yeah yeah you just sound like such an agile organization you know, the ability just to react to something the yeah. warm space thing has been in- interesting to me the more i've tried to bribe people to come onto my podcast to talk to actually i keep coming across warm spaces there's a fantastic lady i'm hoping to interview called kirsty chapman that runs the better oh, yes, cafe in Venno. yeah she's doing the same a friend of mine steph burgess flux is a counselor in cows i know that she talks about the wi hall in cows where people can go to i met this wonderful lady whose name is evaporated from the front, front of my head apologies, <laughs> apologies if you're listening who is cooking food at cost at, but this is mass catering this is not a shepherd's pie for a family this is 400 shepherd's pies and she's doing it from her house wow and she's just doing it through through facebook and people are being tagged and going along so i find that's one thing i think that we as a community you must see this in a, a sort of a micro level to community but we as brits we do so well we do rally don't we we do love a exactly. rally exactly yeah uh, that sounds good. Rachel, let's move on from Pan Together. Let me ask, yeah. let me learn a little bit more about you. I'd love to know more about you. Now, you mentioned in the chat before we had the press record that you moved to the island for this new role. You live in Bonchurch, right? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Very now, I, yeah, you, you mentioned a church, which was it 1024 in Bonchurch? No, I, it, it, it's, a, it's an 11th century church, which was rebuilt in 1082. I think it's hilarious being rebuilt in 1082. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, I, there's all sorts of jokes to make about modern building standards in there, I'm sure, but I'm not going to do that. But one, <laughs> of the things I've, one of the things I've started to get on this podcast, as people have been listening to it, I think maybe I've got into this group of people that are thinking about moving to the islands. So the question I've been asked twice is, Ben, where would I live on the Isle of Wight? So if you were moving to the Isle of Wight for the first time, Rachel, would you choose Bond Church again and why? Yes, I would. I moved to Ven- I moved to the Isle of Wight in 2010, specifically for a job in Ventnor, which of course is adjacent to Bonchurch. Ventnor is a fantastic town and I love it. It's so vibrant. There's so much going on. There's lots of lovely pubs and restaurants. The seafront's fantastic. It's gorgeous. I would say there's an amalgam of people. If you go into a couple of the pubs I can think of, there'll be the gentleman in red trousers people together with people who are working on building sites and with little ones. Yeah, it's a really good mixture. And again, people mostly seem to get along 
my brother appeared on a website called look at my red trousers.com <laughs> he was caught in cows wearing his red trousers jack <laughs> if you're listening to this that will never be forgotten just to let you know. <laughs> brilliant okay look, i'm gonna ask you my final question rachel because i think that i've probably taken the isle of wight's busiest person for oh, half an hour hardly. of their time i'm not sure about that i think busy people always say they're not busy and i have a, i have a feeling that you're you've got a lot on your plate so i'm gonna ask the final question is who should i interview next and how do i get hold of them i think you should interview a lovely chap called xavier baker now he's the co he lives in Venner. he's the co-founder of isle of wight distillery which makes mermaids gin amongst many other things and has won awards and all sorts but as well as that sort of interesting bit about being um, a distiller, they're opening a new site on the road to Areton, so that's a work in progress. But also Xavier's, with a couple of his friends, is going to be rowing across the Atlantic next year to raise awareness about the pollution of the oceans. Yeah, so- I saw that. in that, And the thing they're rowing in is minuscule. Yeah. It's tiny. Yeah. How many bottles of mermaid gin can they fit in it? Well, you'll have to ask him that, Ben. <laughs> I will. I'll have to. Zav, if you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to get. I'm going to get you on. You're going to be next. Rachel, how do people listening to this learn more about Pan Together? They can visit our website, which is www.pantogether.org.uk. They can go on to Pan Together's Facebook page, which is pretty active and is probably more newsworthy than the website. And alternatively, they can give us a ring. And our number is 01983-248-170. Brilliant. And final question, if anybody listening to this wants to do something to help, what would they do? Just get in touch with you, Rachel? Yeah, just get in touch with me. And I'm sure we can think of something because there are lots and lots of different ways that people can help most definitely. And it'd be very much appreciated. Super. Rachel, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to have you on the podcast. I've certainly learned something. I hope people that listen to this have learned something as well. Inspiring organisations. And congratulations on your award from the Queen. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Rachel. Cheerio. Bye.